Uh, if you want to support our cause, one way to do it is to buy these things. These are the GNU slash Linux inside stickers for two euros. And these are the Run GCC stickers <laughs> for two euros. And these are the little GNU head buttons for two euros. We also have these Ask Me About Free Software buttons for four euros. And these uh, gold colored lapel pins for 15 euros. We don't make them anymore. And uh, please come and buy now. Uh, we also have stickers over here that are gratis. Please come and take stickers. And you can take as many stickers as you can put to good use. Please don't put them on your clothing right now because that would waste them. <laughs> put them in permanent places where people will see them and they'll help spread the word. So if you can use 10 stickers, take 10. If you can use 50 stickers, by giving them out to other people, take 50. The purpose of them is to be used. Uh, yes, I do. Ja, ik zal wel recht blijven staan. Hm? Ik zal wel recht blijven staan. Ik bedoel gewoon ja, dat dat ding. Schil van muziek? Ja, perfect. Wat?
It's okay on certain conditions. Please do not distribute it in, uh, except in the formats that are favorable to free software, which are the AUG formats and the WebM format. Please do not distribute in MP anything. We want to discourage use of those formats because they are patented. Especially do not distribute it in Flash. So don't put it in a video site that distributes Flash. Flash requires non-free software in general. So it's bad for websites to use Flash in any way at all. And I hope you'll complain every time you find one that does. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I have a cold and I'm sort of Flemish today. <laughs> Second, also don't distribute it in real player, Windows Media Player, or QuickTime. Also, please make sure that normal access to the distribution site allows downloading a copy without the need for the user to run any non-free software. Now this is what makes YouTube a bad site. Normal access to YouTube requires running non-free JavaScript code even to look at the video. And finally, please put on the recording the Creative Commons No Derivatives License because this is a presentation of a point of view. So, what is free software? When I say it in English, Unfortunately, I have to use this ambiguous word, free, but in this case, it means free as in freedom. We're not talking about price. So it's uh, libre, not gratuit. It's vreya. Uh, so this is absolutely crucial. We don't actually care if A provides a copy of the free program to be in exchange for money. It's neither good nor bad that B is paying money. Uh, that's a minor practical detail that we're not concerned about. We're concerned about whether this program respects B's freedom once B has a copy. Freedom is important, and that's what we're campaigning for. But what is a program? What is a computer? A computer is a universal computing engine. Conceptually, it's very simple. All it knows how to do is get the next instruction and do what it says. And get the next instruction and do what it says. Over and over and over, billions of times a second, it'll get the next instruction and do what that says. The instructions come from the program. So depending on what program it's running, the same computer can do anything. Well, not quite anything. There are some things that can't be done. So who gives the instructions to your computer? You may think it's you, when really it's someone else. You may think that the computer obeys you, when really it obeys someone else first, and only obeys you to the extent that someone else permits it to. With any program, there are two possibilities. Either the users control the program, or the program controls the users. It's always one or the other, because nothing else is possible. When the users control the program, that's free software. Why so? What is freedom? Freedom is having control of your own life. Control, therefore, of the activities you do in your life. But if you use a program to do the activity, control of the activity requires you have control of the programs you're using to do it. That's why it's proper to say that the program is free when the users have control of the program. In order for them to have control of the program, they need the four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is 
to run the program as you wish for any purpose. Freedom one is to study how the program works and change it so it does your computing the way you wish it to. Practically speaking, this requires having the source code. So, here is some source code. It's a combination of math and English. And if you know the programming language, you can understand what that means. You can see what the program does, and you can change it to do something else. typically convert it into an executable. Over there is, an ex is some executable code. It's completely incomprehensible. <clears throat> For such a small program, you could figure out what it does. But if you get uh, a, hundred, a program that's 100,000 lines long, and you get only the executable form of it, to figure out what it does is a tremendously hard job known as reverse engineering. If people were theoretically, nominally free to change the program, but they had to do reverse engineering first, this obstacle is too great. So, practically speaking, they wouldn't be allowed to change the program. So, free software must come with source code. These two freedoms give users separate control over the program, meaning I can change my copies, you can change your copies, you can change your copies, all of us separately. Well, that's essential, but it's not enough. <clears throat> because most users don't know how to program. They aren't, they aren't programmers, they do other things. So how are they going to participate in having control over the program? If the only control is separate, they can't. So we also need collective control. The freedom to collaborate with others in exercising control over that program. At the top we see a group of three users who are working together to control how that program works. Two of them, you can see, are directly changing the code. They must be programmers, obviously. Evidently, they know how to do that. The one on the left is not directly changing the code. Maybe he doesn't know how to program, but he participates in their discussions about what changes to make, and thus, through collective control, he has some control over what that program is going to do. <clears throat> the people who collaborate are those who choose to collaborate. There are two users at the bottom who are not part of that group. They are using the program separately. Why aren't they working together? Maybe they don't get along. Maybe they have different desires for what the program should do. Maybe they just never met each other. Maybe tomorrow they'll start working together. It's entirely up to them whether they work together or not. The point is everyone should be free to work with whoever else wants to. That's collective control. Collective control requires two more essential freedoms. Freedom two is the freedom to make exact copies and give or sell them to others when you wish. Freedom three is to make copies of your modified versions and give or sell them to others when you wish. These two freedoms make it possible for those who choose to collaborate as a group to do so. Because when one makes a modified version, 
then with Freedom 3, that one can make copies and provide them to others in the group. And they, using Freedom 2, can make more copies of that version and pass them along to others in the group. In addition, they, these freedoms allow members of the group to offer copies to others, even to the public. Part of Freedom 2 has a special moral importance. That part is sharing. Sharing copies, which means non-commercial redistribution of exact copies. That has a special moral importance because that is what makes people a community. This is helping each other. <clears throat> and any attempt to stop people from sharing is anti-social, it's a direct attack on society. People must be free to share copies of any published work. That's not as much freedom as free software gives you. Software is different from many other kinds of works because it's meant to be used to do a practical job. You don't just look at the program and say how beautifully written. No, well, there are programs written only for that, but they are rare. Normally, a program is written so that by running it, you get a job done. And that's what makes it a work made for practical use. And those are the works that need to be free, so that people can control the activities in which they are using the programs and other practical works. So, if the program gives you these four freedoms, in full, then it's free software because the, u the users control the program. But if one of these freedoms is missing or incomplete, <coughs> then the users don't control the program. Instead, the program controls the users and the owner controls the program. So this non-free or proprietary program <coughs> In French, we call it a privateur, because it deprives people of their freedom. No one has found such a good term in English yet. This program is an instrument giving the owner power over the users. It's an injustice. Every proprietary program is an injustice, and this is <coughs> So it's better to develop no software than develop proprietary software. If you develop proprietary software, you're helping somebody subjugate others. Don't do it. <coughs> but this injustice typically leads to other injustices. There are plenty of seats if you want to stay around for a while. <clears throat> because with proprietary software nowadays, the developers know that they're going to have power or already do have power over the users. That's probably their motive for developing the program at all. <clears throat> so they tempt their constantly tempted to use the, to take advantage of that power to mistreat the users. For instance, they spy on the users, called spyware. This example is the Amazon Swindle, Amazon's ebook reader, that swindles readers out of the traditional freedoms of readers of books. For instance, it reports what users read. Every so often, it sends the title of the book being read and the page number to Amazon. If the user enters any notes, sent to Amazon. If the user underlines anything, sent to Amazon. It's an Orwellian device in multiple ways. Spy functionalities are known in Windows, in Mac OS, 
in the iThing, <coughs> Apple, for instance, can extract various personal data from an iPhone remotely at any time. In Flash Player, in nearly all portable phones, uh, the United States and I suppose some other countries require them to send the GPS location on remote command and the user can't completely disable this. <clears throat> and many apps for mobile devices send information to hundreds of companies. An investigation found that the average number of places informed by each app was over 100. Some, of course, informed less than 100, and some informed more than 100. But that's not all. <coughs> then there's the functionality of refusing to function, where things are designed specifically to restrict what users can do. I'm talking about DRM, Digital Restrictions Management, also known as handcuffware. <coughs> And I'm not talking about a missing feature. There's nothing wrong with not implementing a feature users would like. Nobody can do everything that people would like. When a free software developer doesn't implement a certain feature and you complain to him, he's entitled to say, I don't have time, why don't you add it? And if you really want it enough, you ought to add it. Why don't you do some of the work? Of course, in a proprietary program, that excuse is not available. The proprietary developer won't let you add features, and that's culpable. Failing to implement a feature is not culpable. Stopping you from adding it is culpable. But that's not what's going on here. This is worse, because here they work for years to design some encryption system to make sure you can't possibly do the job you want to do. This is the notorious evil blue ray that shoots at users <laughs> when they try to copy. I'm not being literal here, of course. <clears throat> I'm talking about a system of encryption and digital restrictions management that stops users from copying. We can't assume that we will always break the DRM. No one has produced free software that can break the DRM on Blu-ray discs in general, which means every Blu-ray disc is the enemy of your freedom. So don't surrender your freedom. I have never used a Blu-ray disc in my life, and I never will until somebody breaks the DRM. But things are getting even worse because with streaming services, they could change the DRM scheme at any moment. In, in just a moment, they, they could put in a different DRM scheme and tell everyone you have to get the upgrade for the player program. So it would be no use to break the DRM for something vicious like Netflix or Spotify, because <coughs> they would just change it. With, with Blu-ray discs, they do change the DRM scheme, but they can only do it from time to time. But a streaming service could do it instantly, any number of times. The only way we can defeat them is by rejecting them. <coughs> DRM has been found in Windows, in Mac OS, in Flash Player, in the iThings, in the Amazon Swindle, of course. But it gets even worse because another malicious functionality is to sabotage users, to, att sorry, to attack users, better say. I'm talking about back doors. A backdoor is a functionality that accepts remote commands to do something to the user. Do what? It could be anything depending on what they programmed it to do. The Amazon Swindle 
has a back door for remotely erasing books. We know this because in 2009, people observed that thousands of copies of a particular book disappeared all at once. In an Orwellian act, Amazon had sent commands to erase those thousands of copies. And what book was it? It was 1984 by George Orwell. If I were writing fiction, I wouldn't dare make that up. It would be too implausible, right? But this is fact. So, <clears throat> there was a lot of criticism. So Amazon promised it would never do this again unless ordered to by the state. If you've read 1984, that's not a very comforting promise, is it? But it doesn't matter because it wasn't a serious promise. Amazon doesn't keep this promise. It was never meant to be a real promise. Amazon has gone back to remotely erasing books when it feels like it without even a command from the state. This is common, by the way. People criticize a company so the company says, we'll never do this again. That doesn't mean it'll really never do this again. Can't believe what a company says. Backdoors are also known in Windows, in Android, in portable phones, and uh, I can't remember now the others. There's also censorship. Apple pioneered censorship with the iPhone. Censorship of applications, that is. With the iPhone, the user could not freely install any application program whatsoever. The iPhone would only install applications from the App Store, those that had been approved by Apple. This is censorship. Apple carries out the censorship based on its commercial interests and political preferences. For instance, uh, an app that would show people information about U.S. drone attacks and civilian casualties was repeatedly blocked, giving various excuses until Apple admitted that it was for dislike of the political attitude being presented. <clears throat> Also, it was noticed at one point that Apple was rejecting all apps meant to give people information on where to get an abortion, but it was accepting the apps of the fraudulent crisis pregnancy centers that exist only to mislead women and give them false uh, information claiming that abortions are terribly dangerous and refused to help them find where they could actually get one. Since then, Microsoft followed Apple's lead. Microsoft does the same kind of censorship. <clears throat> so, there's also another kind of sabotage. When Sony first sold the PlayStation 3, it had two modes of use. One was to play games on Sony's gaming network. The other was to <clears throat> run some other operating system, such as GNU slash Linux. Then somebody figured out a way to break some of the DRM from GNU slash Linux. So Sony decided to uh, make users take, sorry, to take away that mode of use. Sony released a downgrade and said to users, if you install the downgrade, you will lose the ability to run GNU slash Linux. But if you don't install the downgrade, you won't be able to play on the gaming network anymore because Sony had changed the protocol. <coughs> Another form of sabotage is from universal backdoors. 
A universal backdoor is one that uh, gives somebody the power to install changes in the software. It's universal in the same sense that a computer is universal. This kind of backdoor can be used to do absolutely anything to the user remotely without asking permission. Windows has a universal backdoor. It has existed, well, it was first discovered in Windows XP. Microsoft did not acknowledge it, but people proved it was there. And to show how ethical standards keep going down, in Windows 10, Microsoft acknowledges there's a universal backdoor. Microsoft announces this proudly. <clears throat> universal backdoors have also been found in, uh, in the Amazon swindle and nearly all portable phones. They can remotely change the software. And this has been used to remotely convert them into listening devices. And once they're changed, they listen all the time and they transmit all the conversation they hear. You don't have to speak into the microphone, it can listen to you from across the room. And if you think of getting some privacy by switching it off, the joke's on you. Because it pretends to switch off, but really it keeps running and listening and transmitting all the time. The only way to stop it is to take out all the batteries. All the batteries. Because sometimes there's a big visible battery that you can remove, and another smaller battery that you can't remove. Sometimes you can't remove the big visible battery. Basically, one has to wonder why. So this is why I don't have a portable phone. I thought about it, and I found out that they track you everywhere, and they can listen to you all the time. And I said, this is Stalin's dream. No thanks. So I use portable phones. I use other people's portable phones. <laughs> I say, uh, could you please make a call for me? And sooner or later, someone says yes. <clears throat> Another, oh, there's also a backdoor in Android. Android contains some free components and some proprietary components. One of the proprietary components is Google Play which uh, is used for accessing Google services and App Store. It has a backdoor allowing Google to forcibly install or deinstall any app. Now, an Android expert told me that this is not fully equivalent to a universal backdoor. But I'm sure Google could do rather nasty things with it. Google could develop an app just for you and install it into your device without your knowing. There's a universal backdoor in the op sorry, there is a backdoor but not universal as far as we know in the eye things as well. Another form of sabotage is that Microsoft, when it finds a security bug in Windows, shows it to the NSA first and then fixes it <coughs> after giving the NSA a chance to attack everybody's computers. <laughs> Do you think your government should use Windows? Obviously not. So I've given you enough examples to show that the users of proprietary software in general are being dragged behind the bus. That's what proprietary software does. <coughs> there are thousands of more, thousands of other proprietary programs, and we don't know whether they're malware or not. We can't check. The same ones who have the temptation to make them malware are stopping us from checking them. This has to raise suspicions. Why do they do this? 
it's not that they are just vicious and greedy and no and nasty wanting to hurt everybody. No, they have found ways to profit by mistreating people. <clears throat> so in some cases we know that a proprietary program is malware. I've given you some examples. We have lots more. Look at GNU.org slash proprietary for dozens of examples. And then in the other thousands of cases, we don't actually know. So those are possible malware. But there's no way to verify that a proprietary program is not malware. <clears throat> so the result is, every proprietary program is either <coughs> known and proved malware or possible malware. You can never have a rational basis to trust a proprietary program. The only way to have a rational basis is with free software. <clears throat> proprietary software is, using proprietary software is asking to be mistreated. But why is it so rare to find malicious functionalities in free software? Because the users have a defense. They have, a, they have control of the program. If there is any malicious functionality, users have a chance to spot it, and then they're free to remove it. And we contributors know this. So we know that we don't have power so we are not faced with the same temptation. We are saved by not having power. Saved from being corrupted. But the proprietary software world is corrupted. They have no shame anymore. They have conferences where they show their latest advances in how to mistreat their users. So, if you don't want to be the victim all the time, escape and come to the free world that we have built. We built it with the GNU operating system plus Linux the kernel. I started developing GNU in 1984 in January. I wanted to make it possible to use a computer in freedom. That was impossible at the time because the computer won't run without an operating system, and all the operating systems were proprietary. So as soon as you had an operating system installed, there went your freedom. But I, as an operating system developer, realized I could change that. All I had to do was develop an operating system. Then, as the author, I could legally make it free software that everyone could use computers in freedom by running my system. So I wrote some of the components myself. I recruited people to write other components. In some cases, I persuaded another project to release software as free. For instance, BSD. You may have heard of, the, of BSD operating systems. Well, BSD existed in 1984. It was a proprietary modified version of Unix. In 85, I visited the developers of BSD and urged them to separate their code from AT&T's code and release their code as free software. A few years later, they started doing this. Now, my motive was I wanted to use that code in the GNU system, and we did. And there were other projects that released free software for other motives of their own, such as the X Window system and Tech, which are very useful programs, but they would never have made a complete free operating system because they never had that goal. They weren't trying to reach that. They didn't think of it in terms of giving everyone a way to escape to a free world. It's the GNU project that set out to reach that goal and brought us to the free world. And by the way, GNU 
is a recursive acronym. It stands for GNU's Not Unix. But it's a joke because it's also the name of this animal that lives in Africa. This is an adorable GNU which needs a home. So, the, in 1992, GNU was almost complete, but the kernel was missing. The kernel is the component of an operating system that allocates the machine's resources to the other programs you run. We started developing the kernel in 1990, but that project turned into a sort of research project. It took six years to have a test release. I guess the design I chose was too elegant and advanced. <laughs> oh well, <coughs> nobody succeeds at every, every project. But fortunately we didn't have to wait for it because in 1992, Mr. Torvalds, who had written a proprietary kernel called Linux in 1991, made it free software. At that point, it was possible to use Linux to fill the last gap in the GNU system, producing a complete free operating system that was basically GNU with Linux added. In other words, the GNU slash Linux system. Sad to say, most people don't recognize our work when they talk about it. Most people call the whole system Linux and give us no credit at all. And that is bad for our ability to work to free people. So please give us equal mention. When you talk about the use of this system, or anything that refers to the system as a whole, please call it GNU slash Linux. So don't say, I use Linux. Don't say, which Linux distro are you running? Because what you're using is GNU slash Linux, and all those distros are GNU slash Linux distros. Please recognize our work. GNU slash Linux is basically a free operating system, but in practice, that's not always so. And the reason is, in each version or distribution, people add other programs. And sometimes they add programs that are non-free. And when they do that, the collection as a whole ceases to be free. An operating system is a collection of programs. Hundreds or nowadays often thousands of programs. And in order for a collection of programs to be free, every, every program in the collection, without exception, must be free. If there's one non-free program in the collection, that takes away freedom from any user. So because of that, the collection as a whole takes away freedom from any user. So when they add a non-free program to the GNU slash Linux system, they make a non-free version of GNU slash Linux, which is not a good thing. Unfortunately, that's what they usually do. There are over a thousand distributions, and nearly all of them contain non-free software. There are just a few that are entirely free software. Those are the ethical distributions. For more information about them, look at gnu.org slash distros. The well-known distros tend to be non-free, and you'll find out in that directory also why they are non-free. <clears throat> and that's bad for two reasons. Directly, because people are told, try out the new slash Linux, and they install <coughs> one of those non-free distributions, and they don't get all the way to freedom, and they don't realize this. But in addition, the communications of those non-free distros are very influential. And they are constantly leading people not to think about freedom. Consider Ubuntu, for instance. This is the most influential distribution of GNU slash Linux. Of course, they don't mention GNU, 
they call it Ubuntu Linux, which is not right. But more importantly, they don't respect users' freedom, and uh, it'll install, it installs non-free software, and it offers more non-free software, but worst of all is what it says about this. Because they could say, you deserve freedom in your computing, and you won't get it from us. But obviously they don't say that. Instead, they say, we aim to offer you the best possible user experience. What does that teach people? How do you teach people values? <laughs> By in embodying those values in what you do and what you say. So Ubuntu's actions and words teach people to value convenient user experience rather than freedom. And that's not a good thing. That, that weakens the strength of the, command, of the campaign for freedom. It's the exact opposite of what the free software movement needs. Once you've installed a free GNU slash Linux distro, there's still a danger that non-free programs will run in your computer because many web pages contain programs nowadays. Those programs can be free or non-free, just like any other program. They're typically written in the language JavaScript, so we say JavaScript programs, what we really mean is with the programs that are in web pages. And some of them are free, but most of them are not. And the, when they come in a web page, most browsers will install them without even asking you or warning you or anything. And you end up running non-free software without knowing it. So we developed Libra.js as a defense. Libra.js is an add-on for Firefox. Its job is to analyze all those JavaScript programs to see if each one is either trivial or free. And in those case, it per cases, it permits the JavaScript program to run. But when the program is non-trivial and non-free, Libra.js blocks it and indicates this on the screen so that you are protected from running these non-free programs that you didn't even know about. It also searches heuristically through the site for where and how to complain to the webmasters. <laughs> if you've ever tried complaining to webmasters, you know the hardest part is finding where and how. Libra.js does that for you. It makes complaining quick and easy. So complain. It's very important to complain. You, with Libra.js, you can complain in one minute. In 10 minutes a day, you can complain to 10 different sites. It's a contribution to the free software movement. It's important. Just say, I couldn't use your site because it requires running a non-free JavaScript program. Please fix it. Send. Libra.js even fills in more information about the issue so you don't have to know how to talk about it. <clears throat> well, if you don't run non-free programs, you have control over the computing that's done in your computer. But there's another way you can lose control over your computing activities, and that's SaaS, or Service as a Software Substitute. <laughs> it's possible to have control over a program because a program is a work it exists in copies if you're using it you have a copy of it and that means that if they haven't stopped you you could change your copy of it the SAS means but, oh, sorry, but you can never have control over a service implemented in someone else's computer because those it's being done by programs, copies that belong to that someone else. Even if they're free software, you can't change those copies. You might have your own copy and change it, but you can't change those copies. 
The service owner can change them, but that doesn't give you control. So, using a service instead of running a program automatically means you lose control of the activity. So you must never do it. Never use someone else's service to do a job that a program could possibly do. Because that automatically means you, don't, you lose control where you should have had it. <clears throat> so, confiding your own computing activity to somebody else's server is equivalent to running a non-free program to do it. It does the same harm. You don't have control over what that activity consists of. But it's even worse. <coughs> Some more water. Thank you. So many non-free programs spy on the user. They send data to some server. With SAS, the user has to send the data to a server to, to use the service. So it's the same result. It's snooping on the user. Many non-free programs have universal backdoors. Thanks which allow somebody else to change the code and thus change how the user's computing is done without asking permission to change it. With SAS, since the service <coughs> owner, the service operator, can always install different software, he can change how the user's computing is done without asking the user for permission to change it. Now, since it's his, com it's his computer, he should be free to put different software in it. That much is right. What makes it go wrong is that that computer is doing other people's computing and doing it in the way this one decides. So SAS is inherently equivalent to using a non-free program which is spyware and has a universal backdoor. For our freedom's sake, we have to say no to both. So we want freedom, but we have obstacles that we have to cross. First of all, the companies that accumulate, that subjugate users with proprietary software get lots of money from this. They use their money to make it hard for people to escape. <coughs> That is, they construct social inertia. Many of the obstacles to moving to free software consist of social inertia. People are already doing things a certain way, so it's hard to change it to a different way. For instance, <clears throat> you'll find a lot of schools teach proprietary software, and a lot of businesses run proprietary software. The schools say, we have to teach proprietary software because that's what the businesses want. And the businesses say, we have to use this proprietary software because that's what the schools teach. So they're each waiting for the other. How do you overcome social inertia? Somebody has to say, to hell with the social inertia. We're going to do what's right. We will do it first and the others will follow us. In this case, the schools have to do it, because they exist for society. They have a duty to teach how to be a good citizen, not to lead people into a trap. You'll, we also have found that there is hardware that only functions with Windows. I don't know how often this happens now. There used to be a lot of modems that would only work with Windows. It used, and Microsoft also has lured PC manufacturers into signing contracts that essentially uh, make, that, that make every purchaser pay for a Windows license, whether she wants it or not. In some countries in Europe, people have 
fought legal battles for the right to get reimbursed for the Windows license they're not using. But really, those contracts should be directly and simply prohibited. <clears throat> so when these companies show up to recruit or sell anything, they should be met with protests. Another obstacle is that a lot of people in the free software community have never heard of free software or our ideas. This is because there is uh, another term that some use called open source. <clears throat> the term open source was coined in 1998 by people in the free software community who liked free software but rejected our principal approach to the issue. They wanted a way to talk about the same programs, more or less, but without raising it as an issue of right or wrong, justice or injustice. They coined a term that, had, that hadn't been used before, and that gave them a chance to create a different discourse. They had a chance to decide which ideas to include and which ideas to omit. They omitted the entire ethical foundation of the free software idea and presented it as a matter of just practical convenience. Our values are freedom and community. The values they cite are values of convenience. For instance, we say, if you develop and distribute a program, it is your moral responsibility, it is your duty to respect the freedom of the users to change it and redistribute it. Open source supporters say something different. They say, if you develop and distribute a program, it might be in your practical interest to uh, to let users change and redistribute the program because then they will improve the quality of the code. <clears throat> so for us, freedom and community, for them, code quality. The open source supporters were the majority in 1998 and nearly all the companies in the free software community took that side the politicians and journalists mostly followed the money. Therefore, <clears throat> it soon became the case that the, the major media never talked about free software, only open source. In fact, they spread that term so much that most people who have heard of me or GNU think that we are all doing this in the name of open source. They think I'm a supporter of open source which is like calling Bernie Sanders a conservative. It's just not true. But, mo but lots of people in our community think that. Every week I get mail from people talking about my contributions to open source. I have to tell them, I never supported that. But I even see articles calling me the father of open source. <laughs> <laughs> so, I write a letter to the editor saying, if I'm the father of open source, it was conceived through artificial insemination <laughs> using stolen sperm without my knowledge or consent. <laughs> then I present the name and the ideas of the free software movement and that's the real purpose of the letter, to show people the ideas that were missing from the article. <clears throat> but I like starting with a joke. So I do all I can to spread the word about this, but I can't do enough. There are other free software activists. We can't do enough. We need your help. And you can help us just by saying free software, or Rea, or Lee 
or whatever word for free as freedom exists in your language. Especially, this is especially important when you're in a conversation where others are using the term open source. Don't go along with that. You can bring freedom into the discussion by saying free software, and when someone points this out, you can say, yes, I'm saying free software, because freedom is at stake here. And we shouldn't forget that. It's more important than those other factors like cost and short-term convenience. We've got to think about freedom, and that's why I'm saying so. I'm, I'm referring to that every time I talk about this issue. Another obstacle is hardware we can't run because its specs are secret. So there are companies that offer to sell you a peripheral, say, and they won't tell you how to control it. Instead, they say, here's a proprietary program. Run it and shut up. <laughs> well, we can't run it, so what can we do? We need reverse engineering. Somebody's got to figure out the specs of that hardware and write them down. Then someone else can write a free replacement program, and that way we can use that hardware and be free. If you want to make a technical contribution that is really important, do reverse engineering. This university should have a class in reverse engineering. It's a lucrative career. And there are not many schools to teach it. So be the first in your country. Speaking of schools, schools <coughs> should teach exclusively free software. And they should explain why they teach exclusively free software. Because they aim to prepare citizens to live in a society that is strong, capable, independent, cooperating, and free. In computing, this means graduating people accustomed to using free software. Because teaching kids to use a non-free program is like teaching them to smoke tobacco. It's a way to make them dependent. Schools should refuse to participate in these activities. It's no wonder that some companies offer discounts on proprietary software to schools, just as tobacco companies used to hand out gratis cigarettes to kids to get them hooked. They shouldn't have our cooperation in making people dependent. But there's also a matter of teaching the children to become good, cooperating, helpful members of society. So every class should have this rule. <coughs> Students, if you bring software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share copies with the rest of the class, including the source code in case someone wants to learn because this class is a place where we share our knowledge. Therefore, it's not permitted to bring proprietary software to class unless it's for reverse engineering. <laughs> the school, to set a good example, must follow its own rule. It must bring only free software to class and share copies, including source, with everyone that wants a copy except for reverse engineering exercises, if any. But there's a deeper reason for education in programming. Every program embodies knowledge. When it's proprietary, it withholds that knowledge from the students. A non-free program is the enemy of the spirit of education. It should not be tolerated on a school's campus, except for reverse engineering. But a free program offers that knowledge to students. 
And that's essential for learning to be a good programmer. How do you learn to write good, clear code, especially in large programs? You do it by reading lots of code and writing lots of code. And if it's code for large programs, you've got to read and write large programs. Only free software offers the chance to read the code of large programs that we really use. Then you have to write code for large programs. But to learn, you have to start small. What does it mean to start small writing code for large programs? It means writing small changes in existing large programs. Only free software gives you the chance to write changes for small than bigger in existing large programs we really use. Any school can offer students the chance to master the craft of programming if it is a free software school, and they all should be. Every school should move to free software and stop teaching proprietary software. If you have a relationship with a school, if you're a student or a teacher or an employee or an administrator or a parent, it's your responsibility to campaign for that school to move to free software. The first thing to do is raise the issue privately with the administration. If that doesn't get the job done, start talking about it publicly to raise awareness and by the way, since proprietary software typically snoops on its users, if there is some in a school, it's probably snooping on the students as well. And this now applies to use of services. If a school makes an account in some company's server with the student's name on it, it has already violated that student's privacy. And if it sends any personal information to that account, it's violating the privacy even more. This is intolerable. So, human rights depend on each other. If you lose one, it becomes hard to defend the rest. Now that we use computers for so many daily activities, so many important activities in society, Free software, that is, having control over our computing, has become one of the essential human rights without which we can't defend the others. Just to, uh, just to summarize, I will state the four essential freedoms again. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. Freedom one is the study is the freedom to study the program source code and change it so the program does your computing activities the way you wish. Those two give us separate control over the program. Then freedom two is the freedom to make exact copies and give or sell them to others when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to make copies of your modified versions and give or sell them to others when you wish. It's never mandatory to do these things. You're free to do them if you choose. It's not required. Freedom sometimes requires a sacrifice. That's the nature of life. Fortunately, in this field, they tend to be small sacrifices, some convenience loss a little extra work from, the, from time to time. It doesn't take a hero to make these small sacrifices. But there are people who won't make any sacrifice. There are people who have responded when I suggested doing something with free software. When you can show me a free program that's 100% as powerful and convenient as this program, then I'll switch. And what they are really saying is, for them, the value of freedom is zero. Zero. So, you can't convince those people to value their freedom. 
and they're going to lose it. You can only use them as examples and hope somebody else will learn from their example. So how can you help our movement? Well, if you're a good programmer, you can write free software. Start by contributing to existing projects. When you're good at that, then start new projects. <coughs> but if you're not a programmer, there are other things you can do that are just as important. For instance, you can organize free software activism. That's very important and doesn't require any programming knowledge at all. You can persuade schools and governments to move to free software. Regarding governments, look at GNU.org slash philosophy slash government free software dot html for a list of proposed government policies to help the government move towards free software. You see, the government does its computing not for itself, but rather for the people. Everything it does, it's doing for the people. So, if you lose control over your computing, that's bad for you. You're the victim. And if and I would respond by saying, I'm sorry. It's too bad you have lost your freedom. In some cases, as well as victim, you're also uh, morally responsible. This happens with programs that have a network effect. For instance, if you use Skype, you lost your freedom, but you're also partly to blame because you're pressuring other people to use Skype. When people use Skype, they generally say, I have to use it because my friends and family and co-workers want me to use Skype. So those friends, family, and co-workers are morally responsible for pressuring the, that person to use proprietary software. But in the usual case, it's just your loss that you use proprietary software, and I'm just sorry for you. But when a government agency uses proprietary software, it is doing wrong to the people. It is failing in its responsibility to maintain control of the people's computing. So governments must move to free software. If you become an expert user, you can help other users. For instance, participate in a GNU slash Linux user group. And you can help us just by saying free software. But you can go beyond that. You can learn to give talks like this one and teach people about these ideas. That's a very important way to help. There are other ways, too. Look at gnu.org slash help for a long list. And there are other useful directories in gnu.org as well. For instance, gnu.org slash licenses gives full information about free software licensing. Especially gnu.org slash licenses slash license recommendations.html. It says, it's our guide for what license to use depending on the facts of your project. And gnu.org slash philosophy has dozens of articles about various specific issues concerning free software. There is also, again, gnu.org slash distros that says which gnu slash Linux distros we recommend and that is which ones are free. And there is a gnu.org slash proprietary that says, uh, talks about the malicious functionalities in so many proprietary programs. And gnu.org slash gnu, which describes the history of GNU. There's also fsf.org, the site of the Free Software Foundation. And there you can find political campaigns you can support. You can find resources for 
using, distributing, or developing free software. You can find our shop. You can make donations, and we need them, so please do. And we need, and, and you'll also find that you can use the site to become a member of the FSF. Since I am here, you also have a chance to join and pay your annual dues in cash. And it's good to pay cash whenever possible. In fact, it's very important to pay cash in order to defend against surveillance that goes on through digital payments. I haven't paid anything but, uh, but I haven't paid with a credit card uh, for anything except airlines in many years. And uh, at this point, it's time to present my other identity. I am Saint Ignatius of the Church of Emacs. I bless your computer, my child. I see a computer there that looks like it may need an exorcism. But um, Emacs was originally a program, an extensible text editor that I wrote, which developed into a way of life for many users, as it was extended so much they could do all their computing without ever leaving Emacs. Then it became a church with the launch of the news group, alt.religion.emacs, which you might find amusing to visit. In the church of Emacs, we have a great schism between several rival versions of Emacs. We also have saints, but fortunately no gods. Instead of gods, we adore the one true editor, Emacs. <laughs> to be a member of the Church of Emacs, you must recite the Confession of the Faith. You must say, there is no system but GNU, and Linux is one of its kernels. <laughs> then, if you become a true expert, you can celebrate that with our ceremony, the Fubar Mitzvah, in which you chant a portion of our sacred scriptures, that is to say, the system source code. In the Church of Emacs, we have rejected the priesthood of technology because everyone is welcome to read our sacred scriptures. We also have the cult of the Virgin of Emacs, which refers to anyone who has never used Emacs. <laughs> According to the Church of Emacs, offering the Virgin the opportunity to lose Emacs virginity is a blessed <coughs> act. We also have the Emacs pilgrimage, which consists of invoking all the commands of Emacs in alphabetical order. <laughs> there is a breakaway Tibetan sect which claims that it's sufficient to invoke them automatically under the control of the script. But, according to the Mother Church, to gain spiritual merit, you must type them by hand. <laughs> the Church of Emacs has advantages compared with other churches I won't mention. For instance, 
To be a saint of the Church of Emacs does not require celibacy. <laughs> but it does require living a life of moral purity. You must exorcise whatever evil proprietary operating systems have possessed computers under your control or set up for your regular use and install a wholly free operating system. And then use and install exclusively free software with and on the system. If you make this vow and you live by it, then you too will be a saint and you will have the right to wear a halo if you can find one because they don't make them anymore. <laughs> People have occasionally asked me whether it is a sin in the... Tr well, there's a traditional rivalry between Emacs and the other editor VI. So people have asked me whether it's a sin in the Church of Emacs to use VI. Well, it's true that VI, VI, VI is the editor of the beast. <laughs> but using a free implementation of VI is not a sin, it's a penance. <laughs> and people occasionally ask whether my halo is really an old computer disk. <laughs> this is no computer disk, this is my halo. <laughs> but it was a computer disk in a previous existence. <laughs> Thank you. So we're not quite done yet. This is an adorable canoe that leads a home. So I'm going to auction it for the benefit of the Free Software Foundation. If you buy it, I will sign the card for you. If you have a penguin at home, you need a canoe for your penguin. <laughs> because as we know, a penguin can't hardly function without a canoe. <clears throat> when you bid, please wave your arm and shout the amount so I can hear you uh, and notice you. Don't wait till I look at you before you start to shout. Shout so I will look at you. Fine. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> and we can accept payment in cash, with a credit card, or using Bitcoin if you can make the payment here. And I'm going to start with the regular price of 25 euros. Do I get 25 euros? How much? 20, uh, 25. Okay, I've got 25. Do I get 30? Yeah. He said 30 first. So, what? 40. 40. I've got 40. Do I get 45? 45. I've got 45. Do I get 50 or more? 50. I've got 50. Do I get 55? Do I get 55 euros for this? <laughs> I've got 55, do I get how 75. much? What? 75. I've got 75, do I get 80? 100? I've got 100, do I get 110? I've got 100, do I get 110 euros for this support? 110 euros to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? Do I get 110? Last chance to bid one ten or more for this adorable. <laughs> Last chance to bid one ten or more to the Free Software Foundation. One ten. I've got one ten. Do I get one twenty? How much? I've got one twenty. Do I get one thirty? I've got one twenty. Do I get one thirty for this adorable? <laughs> one thirty to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom. 
Last chance to bid 130 or more. Last chance. Going. Going. Gone for 120. Please come back and pay. So how do you wish to pay? So now we the line for questions. I still have hearing trouble. My trouble is recognizing consonants. So in order for me to hear your questions, you need to speak quietly. Sorry. You need to speak. <laughs> you need to speak loud and slowly. And you need to pronounce each consonant carefully so I can hear it. Is it here? Just doesn't work that way. So I'll sign it after the questions. Thank you. Now you better wash your hands. <laughs> so questions? Um, I, uh, I am a software developer and I'm working for a company who does private software. Proprietary, Proprietary software. software. Because private software exists too, but it's different. Okay. A private program is, say, suppose you write a program and you use it and you never distribute copies. You just use it for yourself. Now that's free software in a trivial way because every user has the four freedoms. You're the only user and you have the four freedoms, so it's free software. Or suppose you paid somebody else to write it for you and you get it as free software and you never distribute it to anyone else. You're free to do so, but you never do. That's also private software and there's nothing wrong with that. So private software is a meaningful concept, but it's not the same as proprietary software. So which one is your is that company doing? Uh, propriety. Well, that's that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's my question. Uh, what would be your tips for uh, helping me to uh, gain money? Because in the end, I need to have money. Right. Well, there are many jobs in the world. Yes. Not just program. <laughs> so if you can't find an ethical job in programming, that's not an excuse to do, to commit an injustice to programming. You can't say, I have the right to get money through programming, even if that means I have to help somebody subjugate people. Morally speaking, that's just not valid. Now you may be able to find an ethical job, for instance, a lot of software development is web development, and that can always be done in an ethical way. Uh, if you hand the developed stuff to the client under a free software license, you're not doing any wrong to the client. The client's going to pay anyway, because nobody's going to do that job without being paid. <clears throat> Of course, you should also treat the visitors to that site ethically. <coughs> By making sure that the JavaScript programs in the pages come with source code and a free license. And lots of other software development is developing private software that a client is going to run and not distribute. 
So if you distribute that software to the client under the new GPL, it'll do the it'll do what the client wants. You'll still get paid to do it, and you're making you making sure that no wrong is done to anybody. If you know that that client is not going to distribute that software, then if you just give the client full rights to it, <coughs> transfer the copyright, you're still not doing any wrong to anybody. So in fact, there's a lot of work in the software field that is done in, as free software or could just as easily be done as free software and the people who are paying wouldn't mind. But the crucial thing is, developing proprietary software is making the world a worse place, and you should never do that. You could imagine, say, a corrupt politician saying, I don't know how to make enough money by being honest. That's obviously no excuse. Yes, um, I have developed free software in the past, distributed under GPL, but it was for, uh, for a particular customer that is currently using that software to subjugate people. Um, By how? It, it is a military organization. Well, so if I were to distribute the software under a license that prohibited them from subjugating well, people, well, first of all, uh, it's I don't, I don't agree with the steps and all the steps in that argument. I don't think that. Uh, military use is necessarily bad because I'm not a pacifist. The other thing is that was that a very general purpose program or was it specifically for a particular military activity? It could be used for other activities, but in this particular case it was used for a very specific activity. But, and is that, so that's what they wanted it for and that's what you developed it for? Yes. Well, you could have just said, no, I won't write that program. Well, at the time, it was not explained to me that they would use it for that purpose. Oh, really? So they misled you about what it was for? Right. Hmm. Now, a license that restricts what purpose the program can be used for is not a free license. It's unacceptable to put that kind of restrictions on programs. And for the full reasoning, uh, there's an article in GNU.org slash philosophy, and uh, I think its name mentions Freedom Zero. Because, yes, there are people who want to do that, but that would be disaster for the free world. If we were willing to tolerate programs with limits on what kinds of jobs they can be used for, it would destroy free software. It wouldn't stop any government from doing anything because it's governments that enforce copyright laws, it's governments that write the copyright laws, and the government can give itself an exception. In fact, though, uh, in many countries, once somebody has a lawful copy, he is free to do whatever he wants with it. So the copyright holder can't limit the purpose, can't limit the uses. But even in, in places where it is possible to limit that, governments wouldn't obey it. But even if they did, it would destroy the free software community because once we accepted limits There'd be so many different usage limits if we allowed them into our system. <coughs> soon you'd have a system that you couldn't actually use for anything because different parts of it would forbid different uses. So basically, you can't stop military activities by putting limits on the use of general purpose free programs.
thanks for being here. Um, so you think it's important uh, to work on the means the top of uh, free software in order to attract more people? Sure, it's very nice to improve the convenience and reliability of free software. Do you think it's a, it's a priority for you, or is it more important to work on the... The most important things to work on are the, the most important free programs that we need are those that will do jobs for which there is no free software now. But making any existing free program better to use is a contribution. JS in uh, HTML uh, and installing programs <coughs> uh, a lot of JS is used for behavior in a document and it is that, it's that but uh, if you had a well, to make it such that you can still use the thing with JavaScript <coughs> disabled I mean, yes, yeah, but if you, if you had a good version of JavaScript. It sorry, no, that doesn't help. That, that's the, uh, maybe a misunderstanding. JavaScript is a programming language. And the only significance, the only re the moral significance is that websites, uh, sorry, web pages contain programs in that language that are sent to run in the user's machine. This is not a function of the details of the JavaScript language. Any language used in that way would have the same moral consequences. But you can't get rid of them by changing that language. <coughs> I think my question really is, when does uh, behavior in a format become a, a programming language? Where, where is the line? Well, we try to draw a line by distinguishing between trivial and non-trivial JavaScript programs. There's obviously no exactly right place to draw that line. But we're trying to approximate it this way. Uh, I was just curious what, where you put the line was. Uh, you can look at our page, gnu.org slash philosophy slash javascript track.html, and it will take you to that definition. about being rewarded. Uh, it basically amounts to saying that you're okay with proprietary speech, but you're not okay with proprietary... Well, the terms free and proprietary are about an issue that applies to works made for practical use. And why is that? Why is the morality of it? Only well, I told you the argument. Why should software be free? Because you use it to do a job, and you should have control over that job. Now, if I were teaching a class, the same argument would apply. I think the textbooks and lectures to teach a practical, to teach a field of knowledge, those should be free. The works that are used for practical work include programs, recipes, educational works, reference works, typefaces for formatting paragraphs of text, 3D printer patterns for making useful objects, and other things that you can find out, you, you can see. So you mean that if I write a program to make music, that can be proprietary, but if I write no, the same program the, to make the music, program, the, the, music, the music doesn't have to be free. <coughs> no, no, but the program <laughs> is not the music. The program is running and making the music, so it has to be free. It's not practical. Why? No yes, practical. it is. It's is doing practical. something. That's Look, please, please, what you're doing is not constructive because you're arguing about what I mean by words I I'm use. Trying to understand your philosophy. Well, you won't understand it by arguing like that. Try to find the meaning I do mean so that you can understand. Yeah, but that's not how philosophy works. That uh, sorry, that's, that's how you can understand what it is I mean. If you want to misunderstand, we will just have a 
dear lobe de, de sur. It's not useful. No, look, you don't have to agree with me, but the first step in agreeing or disagreeing is to understand what I'm saying. That's what I'm trying to do. Well, that's the wrong way. So today you give a speech which has a practical consequence. It has practical consequences a little, but mainly it's showing you what I think. And my view is works that show somebody's point of view, that say what that person thinks or what that person saw, don't, the, don't have to be free because the argument doesn't apply there. You don't have to agree with me. You can disagree, but I've told you what I what my my position is, and I've shown you the reason for it. I stop asking this, but you're, you're saying that this derives from some ethical stance. Yes. And that ethical stance, therefore, is more than just saying try to understand you to defend that. Yes, I've done it. And I've given the argument. Now, the argument is, works that you use to do a practical job must be free. Now, the program that makes music is sort of, is close to the boundary. I think that it's a practical, useful work. It's doing something. But you can argue that it's not, at, it's not as much useful as a compiler or text editor or accounting program. It's just a matter of where you put that boundary. Uh, I don't think it's worth arguing about because it's not a fundamental point. Even if you put the boundary of useful works on the other side of that program, it wouldn't change much. So that's the secondary point of disagreement that I don't think is worth arguing about. I disagree by promise to stop. <laughs> Um, would you say that the four fundamental freedoms also apply to electronics? For example, integrated circuits? Yes and no. A circuit diagram is a work for practical use. But we can't fabricate chips, personally. And if we're going to use chips made in a factory, we get all, basically more or less the same disadvantages as with a non-free design. Which means that with today's technology, to reject chips made from non-free design would not get us much, and it would screw us totally. So under today's circumstances, I see no sense in rejecting chips on that, on those grounds. But that may, the situation may change. In a few decades, we may have personal fabricators and we could fabricate our own chips. And then we will need to demand free chip designs. That Then the argument will totally apply to chip designs, exactly the same as the software. By the way, when you're using FPGAs, the FPGA is hardware, but the gate pattern in it is software. There's another wrinkle of this. Sometimes in a product, there may be software whose presence is not clear to the user. It may be hard to tell whether at a certain level of the design there is some software or not. Well, if we can't tell, it makes no practical difference. So there's no point making a fuss about embedded software that the users don't touch. But when the users install this software, then it's clearly up at the level where we have to take cognizance of it. And we must insist it be free. There's some gray area between those. And as in the case of many gray areas, it's not terribly important exactly where you draw the line through it. Uh, what do you think about the risk of uh, backlogs in big free software projects like uh, GCC, for example? It's not impossible. 
free software is the only known defense against <coughs> malicious functionalities. But it's not a perfect or guaranteed defense. However, it's a lot better than being defenseless. Well, it's not that simple because other people are looking at the changes. So, it's a possibility. Yeah, but that's why I told you big soft like CCC. It's very difficult to look to all the sources. Sorry, but all the code was put in at some point. And at that point, people studied it. So GCC is this big because people have been working on it for 25 years. Actually, no, more than uh, 29 years, I think, maybe 28 years. So that code got put in over that time. And over that time, other people could look at lots of code. So. It's not impossible, but it's not so trivial. Anyway, at this point, we don't know any other defense. It's no use comparing it to an imaginary perfection. Uh, for a long time, uh, both GCC and Unix, under your maintainership, had a policy that you wouldn't accept certain contributions that you saw as uh, making it easy to extend them in proprietary ways. Right. right. And this was absolutely necessary because the goal of GNU, and <coughs> therefore the goal of every piece of GNU, is not merely to be useful, not merely to be a success, but to give people freedom in their computing. Okay, so my, uh, my question is, uh, since, uh, as far as I can tell, that policy in practice has been rescinded. So yes, it, and I decided to because I right, people right. found another solution, right, so a way I, we can insist that plugins be free. Right, so in the case of uh, Inax now, we have binary local things. In the case of PCC, uh, you, you can export the syntax tree and so on. Uh, so my question is, uh, Basically, you can export the syntax right. tree. I didn't know that you could. Uh, but there are some features I think that GCC refused to implement that LLVM had implemented, and that GCC would basically force to do the same thing. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, an unfortunate thing in the case of LLVM because basically they developed a non copyleft free program to do a job that we had a copyleft free program for. So and I, that weakens our defense of freedom. So I understand why it was done with My question is, uh, in hindsight, do you think that was the right thing to do? Or do you yes, think that, you know, absolutely uh, was the right thing to do. You know, or, like another way to look at it is, if you refuse to accept contributions that make certain things easier, people would write replacement programs. That's that not, but that, they had a tremendous amount of work to do and they started it. Right because they wanted to make a compiler that was easier to understand. Basically, I was trying to win freedom as fast as possible. I didn't have time to spend years redoing every part of GCC to make it better. Because we were fighting a war for your freedom. And uh, the compiler was needed now. So I wrote it as fast as I could. That makes sense. I was just wondering if you if you still thought that as a maintainer of free software, whether versus I should absolutely you should defend freedom. You should absolutely you should use copyleft and you should defend copyleft so as to uh, give free software an advantage over proprietary software. Proprietary software is people trying to subjugate our world. And free software is trying to free our world. And refusing to give a head start to a proprietary program is a crucial part of the strategy for defeating proprietary software. Yeah, thanks. I was, I was wondering how you thought about that. Thanks. What is your opinion on GitHub? <coughs> GitHub has a number of serious problems and ethical problems. 
Some operations require non-free JavaScript code is the first one. But oh, getting worse, they lead people into sloppy license practices. For instance, there are many programs on GitHub that don't stay to license. They're proprietary. A program with no license is proprietary. Any work under today's copyright law, uh, the blame for this is the uh, Berne Convention, uh, a treaty that should be torn up and destroyed. But because of that treaty, everything written is copyright, automatically. And therefore, a program which doesn't state a free license is proprietary. But then there are programs in GitHub where the README makes a terse, cryptic statement about licensing and none of the other files say anything. Well, maybe courts will say that that code is under the license named in that README file. But are we sure? And maybe somebody will copy one of those files somewhere else and it will be separated from its license. That's not good either. That people won't know what its license is and they might redistribute it in a way that is copyright infringing or they might think they can't use it when they can. It's not good. And people may just say, may are led by GitHub to say, this is under GPL version 3. Well, that's not the way you should use GPL version 3. You should say this can be distributed under GPL version 3 or any later version published by the Free Software Foundation. If they don't say that, then its license won't smoothly upgrade. So there are many bad practices that GitHub leads people to. Yes, uh, I agree with that, but actually I was thinking about the fact that GitHub is taking a bit of a SAS. Well, but it's actually, it's not clear to me. First of all, they, they do, okay, they do distribute that software as proprietary software. However, that makes no difference to you if you're using their server. If they didn't distribute the software at all, that wouldn't change anything when you use their server. Now, if they distributed that software as free software, that would be a good thing. That would contribute positively to the free world. They don't make that contribution. But that wouldn't by itself be a reason not to use their server. After all, we're not very concerned with privacy. We're talking about things we're publishing. Uh, and the other thing is, I'm not sure it's SAS, because mainly what it's doing is it's storing data for us, uh, any such repository. It's mainly storing and publishing data for us. So mostly that's not doing computing, mostly it's holding things we want to post. Yeah, but you know, some so is Facebook. <coughs> yeah, Facebook. Mo the basic use of Facebook is not SAS. It's an injustice for a totally different reason. The difference between free and open source is not very clear. Uh, is it only philosophical or can we name all open source programs free okay. or is there okay. other difference? Both free software and open source have practical definitions, and they both have philosophy. <coughs> the practical definitions are written very differently, but they are almost equivalent, but not 100%. I know of one program whose source code is open source, but it's not free. That's Open Wacom. And the reason is its license has a restriction we consider unacceptable. As far as I know, all existing free software is open source. But I don't think that that is inevitably the case. And 
the other way around? All well, I just said, is? not all open source programs are free, because I know of one exception. But most of them, nearly all of them, are free. And then the other way around, all for, as far as I know, all free software is open source. <coughs> but I won't say that that is guaranteed always to be true. Okay, that's the practical level. There's also a situation where the source code can be free and the executable can be non-free. This happens in some Android devices, specifically with Linux. Not the GNU slash Linux system. Uh, Android doesn't have GNU in it, but it does have Linux, the kernel. In some Android devices, the device checks for a signature and refuses to run a different version or a modified version of Linux. Its source code is available, and that's distributed under GPL version 2. It's free software. But the executable is not free because the user can't change that. Now, open source is not concerned with this issue. The definition of open source just looks at how the source code is distributed. So uh, that, that version of Linux in that product is open source. The executable is open source, but not free. The source code is open source, and it's free. Now, this is the practical comparison. Now, when we look at the philosophy, the philosophies are have a gaping difference because they're based on different values. The fact that they're almost the same in practice is no coincidence. They wanted another term to use instead of free software, but they used somebody else's definition, and it turned out not to be equivalent in practice. And it was interpreted by a different group. Um, isn't um, isn't using uh, in distributing uh, Linux images that require a signature to function on a piece of hardware technically speaking infringing even under GPL no, two? No, it doesn't violate GPL version two. But isn't um, couldn't you consider the uh, private key the need to get that binary uh, running as part of the source code of the signed package? Uh, I don't. I don't think that's the case with GPL version 2. That's why we changed that part of the license in GPL version 3. By the way, if you were leaving, please come here and get stickers, or at least you're welcome to, before you go. And you can also buy things over here. Uh, so you don't have to miss out just because you're leaving early. Yeah. I read an article a few years ago that said you were using a MIPS laptop, and I was interested in if you're still using a MIPS laptop. No, I used that because it could run with a free BIOS. But now I'm using a different machine that can run with a free BIOS. In fact, <coughs> this is a ThinkPad X60. Those are really hard to get. Yeah, well, now there are newer versions that are being distributed. In fact, since a couple of years ago, oh, um, let's see if I do. Does anyone have change for five euros, for instance? Oh, I have changed for 20. What? Oh, I've made it. 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 I've made